Thank you very much for Dr. Rice's illuminating lecture. It rightly reminds us that Christian ethics is more than a set of do's and don'ts. It is indivisible from our identity and our purpose. Now it's time for respondents. Dr. Edwin Moon, lecturer in Old Testament from Chinese Mission Seminary, will be the first respondent. After that, Dr. Chen Lun Wu, assistant professor in biblical studies from CGST, will carry the conversation on. So Dr. Moon, please. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for coming over to Hong Kong to present us with a series of stimulating and insightful lectures. And thank you, uh, President Wong and CS, uh, CGST for inviting me to respond to Dr. Wright's lecture this afternoon. Dr. Wright is one of the pioneers on Christian ethics and a prolific writer on this subject matter especially in the field of the Old Testament. Many of us are familiar with Dr. Wright's paradigmatic approach that links God, humanity, and the earth in a triangle and integrates Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament in a sub-triangle, both typologically and eschatologically. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Wright's lecture in the following three aspects. First of all, um, I appreciate Dr. Wright's holistic and exegetical approach in cultivating the topic, the Old Testament and Christian ethics, how should we live? Dr. Wright clearly demonstrates the Pentateuch as a paradigm and the revelation of God for Christian ethics. Dr. Wright thoughtfully selects, selects four representative passages from each book of the Pentateuch, except Numbers. I wholly agree with Dr. Wright's missional and ethical hermeneutics of the election of Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, verse 18 and 19. The insertion of the two purpose crosses for the purpose that is judicious and makes God's purpose of the election crystal clear. This missional election corresponds and further elaborates the Abraham Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Abraham and his descendants are chosen for the ethical mission to walk in the way of the Lord and to do justice and righteousness. Indeed, that is God's mission of blessing all nations through the chosen family of Abraham. Dr. Wright tactfully connects the identity of, of Israel as the descendant of Abraham with the missional redemption of the nation of Israel in Exodus. The arguments, the arguments for the missional ethics and the covenantal community of Israel in the programmatic texts of Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 through 6, Leviticus 19, and Deuteronomy chapter 4, 6 to 8, are convincingly knitted together and evidently presented. Secondly, Dr. Wright introduced a concrete example of an unethical corrupted city of Sodom that depicts the fallenness of our world today. It urges Christians to reflect on the reality of judgment and salvation in the light of our missional ethical calling to walk in the way of the Lord and do justice and righteousness. Dr. Wright translated the abstract ethical principle of Leviticus 19 into down-to-earth pragmatic advice. These ethical codes of living in Leviticus 19 are both relevant and practical 
for the Christian community today. They reflect the holiness of God, and we, as Christians, are called to separate from this world and walk in the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. The list is a microcosm of ethical living that incorporates in all capacity of living, namely social, economic, legal, political, and religious dimensions of our society. We are being challenged to transform these holiness living codes into practice in our existing social institutions and structures. We are reminded to be a community of faith to fulfill God's mission to bless all nations. Last but not least, Dr. Wright beautifully concludes his presentation with Paul and Peter's teachings, which are written in the Old Testament. It demonstrates that there is continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Dr. Wright further quotes the Cape Town commitment of the Lausanne movement to summarize his conclusion that we share the same missional identity and missional purpose to lift out the missional ethics of Abraham and the people of Israel. We are God's chosen people. Through the redemption and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we all partake in God's mission to bless all nations through evangelism. As the teacher of the Old Testament, I share Dr. Wright's concern of the lack of understanding of the Old Testament in the Christian community. I agree with Dr. Wright that if we do not know the drama of the scripture, both the Old and New Testaments, we may lose our grip on our identity, our purpose of existence, and fail to live according to God's attributes and mission. In closing, I would like to respond to Dr. Dr. Wright's the final paragraph uh, on obeying God's Lord. Sometimes, even though we are familiar with the plot and the story of the scripture, remember commandments and know God's attributes and mission, we may still have difficulties. We can struggle to figure out how should we live ethically according to the scripture in a sophisticated postmodern commercial world that is dominated by materialism, consumerism, relativism, and self-centeredness? How do we obey God's law in such controversial gray areas, especially in the arena of social justice? under the rule of atheist governments or anti-Christianity authorities. When everyone is doing what is just in his or her own eyes, what it is our stance? The programmatic text in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, also Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 through uh, 19, uh, both shed light in response to the questions about. It says, For observing the law will show wisdom and understanding to the nation. Surely, this great nation is wise and understanding people. Wisdom and understanding will equip us to obey God's law and lift out our missional and ethical calling. The wisdom literature in the Old Testament, namely the book of Proverbs, the book of Job, and the book of Ecclesiastes, summarize wisdom in one phrase, fear of the Lord. If we fear the Lord, we will keep his commandments as concluded in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, and will turn away from evil as stated in Job chapter 1, verse 1 and 8, chapter 2, verse 3, and chapter 
and chapter, chapter 28, verse 28. It will lead us to walk with the Lord and follow His instructions. The fear of the Lord is concerned with the knowledge of the Lord in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The knowledge of the Lord is not only limited to head knowledge. Memorizing the golden verses of the of the Chinese of the of the scripture in Chinese uh, Christian traditions, but also on focusing on our relationship with the Lord. As the psalmist echoes Moses' teaching in Deuteronomy chapter four verse seven, the Lord is dear to all who call on Him. Psalm eighteen uh, one hundred and forty five. 18a, a close relationship uh, with God and calling on Him when we are lost will help us to discern God's will and guide us to make wise decisions to live out our missional witness. And I find out that um, Dr. Wright mentioned about Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58. And that, that's, I think that's, what, that's what not, not in, in the script. And then it uh, triggered me to think about uh, this chapter because I remember there's a very um, interesting uh, proclaim by, by the Lord. We are familiar with uh, Isaiah chapter 6 when God asked, Who can I send? Then Isaiah uh, responds, Here I am. But in Isaiah chapter 58, when we refrain from oppression, when we are practicing justice, then God will answer, here I am. I think it's in chapter 58, verse 9 or something like that. Okay, the Chinese title, uh, the Chinese translation of the title of, title of today's lecture is quite interesting and thought-provoking. Instead of a literal translation of the question, how should we live? It is translated um, as a statement in English. Obey and follow this. Or obey and do this. In Chinese, the title is Zhen Qi Yang. It connotes a sense of doing rather than being or relating. Indeed, living out a missional ethical living is a matter of doing. The underlying force of doing this or that, in addition to, to the understanding of our identity and mission, is to trust and obey. The book of Numbers reveals stories of the Israel's fail, failure to trust and obey during their wandering in the wilderness. God pronounced that Israel has tested and disobeyed him ten times in number in Numbers chapter 14, verse 22. The renowned story of Joshua and Caleb, two trustful and obedient spies, were being accused by ten doubtful, fearful, and disobedient spies. The latter's fear and doubt influenced the Israelites. Fear and doubt are stumbling blocks in our way to obey the Lord and carry out our ethical mission. Due to distrust, Moses lost his destiny of leading, of leading Israel to the promised land, as found in Numbers chapter 20, verse 12. I think love God is the root of obeying His law. Jesus mentioned three times about loving Him and obeying His commandments. In John chapter 14, verse 15, 21, 23. Love and obey go hand in hand. Love drives away fear and doubt. The stumbling blocks of trusting and obeying God's law. Our Lord Jesus Christ set an excellent example of obeying our Heavenly Father. In, in His prayer in Gethsemane, he seeks God's will over his own will. We may be found faithful and loving in carrying out our missional ethics. 
and love God with all our hearts and with all our soul and with all our strength and with all our mind and love our neighbor as ourselves. For love is the fulfillment of the law. May we adhere to obey God's mission of ethics, despite how great the causes are. Once again, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Wright for, his, for your marvelous and inspiring lecture. Thank you. It is indeed my great privilege to have the opportunity to respond to one of the lectures delivered by Dr. Wright in the Josephine So Lecture Week this year. As suggested by the title written for us, the Old Testament is Christian scripture. The basic tenet of the lecture series is the relevancy of the Old Testament for us, a community of faith today as scripture. Building upon his first lecture on the Old Testament and Christian identity and second lecture on the Old Testament and Christian mission, Dr. Wright brought our thoughts and focus this afternoon to the subject of the Old Testament and Christian ethics, which addresses the question of how we should live as Christians in our contemporary society. The lectures indeed come in a natural sequence as regards the relevancy of the Old Testament in terms of implications for Christian life. While Christian identity is concerned about who we are as defined in the beginning, and Christian mission looks to what we ultimately aim for in the end. Christian ethics comes to address the in-between process and, if you frame it theologically, the already but not yet reality that we are facing today. Simply put, Christian ethics is about how we ought to live our present life in accordance with our rooted identity and our mission that we are anticipating to fulfill. The way the Christian community is expected to live in the world has undoubtedly been a significant and indeed indispensable issue to be addressed in Christian scholarship. This has become even more so in the postmodern age in which systems of moral values and ethics are being ratified. Despite the growing interest in ethics in secular scholarship, over the past few decades, there have not been many Christian scholars who are committed to investigating the biblical material as regards Christian ethics. The situation is shown to be more evident with the subject of Old Testament ethics, which finds an echo in the comment of Ronald Clement. The subject of Old Testament ethics proved to be a most difficult one to deal with. The literature devoted to it has been surprisingly sparse. Dr. Wright is a man of field who has actively been addressing the ethical import of the Old Testament. With the publication of his Old Testament Ethics for the People of God in 2004, Dr. Wright has also been continuing to engage in the subject as a biblical scholar and missiologist. The difficulties for scholars who write on the ethics of the Old Testament are manifold. Three dynamics are worth mentioning. The first is the challenge to relate the interrelated field of study of law and ethics in the Old Testament. Given that ethics is concerned about how people should live with one another in a society, it can hardly be denied that Old Testament ethics is prominently featured with collection of law, which prescribe how people should act with respect to others in certain circumstances. In terms of social function, Old Testament law appears to be tangible manifestation of ethical principles that would engender right interpersonal relationships in a social group. But can Old Testament law as a whole simply be understood to represent Old Testament ethics? Apparently not. While law prescribes for the most part external behavior, ethics is commonly understood to be a moral vision with more fundamental values that regulate the lives of individuals as human beings. Still, it is sometimes not as straightforward when it comes to drawing ethical principles from individual legal statements or even legal terminology in the Old Testament. One example is the Hebrew word mishpat, which commonly translated as justice or judgment in a legal sense, might carry different ethical implications 
that can only be assessed in particular contexts. Even Dr. Wright defines mishpat in its broadest sense as a qualitative set of actions. Nuances in terms of ethical implications might exist across its various usages in the biblical tradition. Despite the inherent challenge of relating law and ethics in the Old Testament, Dr. Wright's approach brings awareness to the importance of envisioning the relationship of law and ethics in light of the narrative framework of the Old Testament. In articulating Old Testament ethics, Dr. Wright never looks at the laws as revealed in the Torah per se, but intends to understand them against the backdrop of Israel's origin and her relationship with Yahweh. Dr. Wright reminds us that the ethical implication of Old Testament law can only be fully grasped in the context of Israel's narrative. Set within the context of Israel's story with Yahweh, Old Testament law is much more than a set of conduct or rules demanded to humanity by God. But it is revelatory of the divine purpose in shaping the life of the community of God's people. Dr. Wright's emphasis on the narrative nature of the Old Testament not only bridges biblical law and ethics, but also constitutes a basis upon which law and ethics can be biblically related. The second challenge for scholars concerns the tensions between the so-called diachronic historical approach and the synchronic literary approach in articulating a discourse on Old Testament ethics. For historical critical scholars, the ethical import of the Bible lies in the real historical world behind the biblical text. Locating ethical truths in history, they tend to look for real ethical values that might have been held by ancient Israelites in the biblical period. Despite its contribution in uncovering the historical reality of the Bible, the historical critical approach has its own limitations. Not only does historical reconstruction remain in a large part a tentative project, but excessive preoccupation with historical vicissitudes would risk fragmentizing the biblical canon rather than viewing it as a unified corpus in terms of ethical insights. John Barton, a known Old Testament scholar, even advises against an Old Testament ethics at all, as he sees no unity of ethical motives across the various parts of the biblical tradition. While historical critics attempt to find ethical truths in history, scholars who appreciate the Bible as literature are inclined to adopt the synchronic literary approach in extracting biblical ethics. For literary critics, it is story rather than history that should be the focus of investigation. In other words, ethical principles are found not in the world behind the biblical text, but are embedded in the world within the text. Notwithstanding its appreciation of biblical accounts as aesthetically crafted and ethically laden constructs, the literary critical strategy does not necessarily presuppose a comprehensive Old Testament ethics that undergirds all biblical texts. Some literary critics rightly point us to the fact that there is a diverse material in terms of ethical teachings across the various biblical genres. Yet, some might go too far in claiming that the diversity is so great that we can only formulate Old Testament ethics according to a collection of books, such as the Pentateuch, historical narratives, wisdom literature, or prophets. So some might name it as ethics in the, old, in the Pentateuch, ethics in the wisdom literature, ethics in the prophets, and so forth. While it might serve as a reminder for us to incorporate a whole span of biblical books in doing Old Testament ethics, especially the lecture today seems to be focused on the Pentateuch, the literary critical strategy might also risk disuniting biblical ethics if no underpinning ethical telos is presumed. In the face of this methodological dilemma, Dr. Wright's theological reading of the Old Testament constitutes not only a possibility, but also a necessity for a comprehensive biblical ethics. Indeed, the crucial issue concerning the dynamic lies not so much in the adopted reading strategy, but in the very fact that the theological nature of the Old Testament has not been prioritized. Read in a Christian canonical perspective, Aspects of ethics in the Old Testament 
is fundamentally theological. As Dr. Wright asserts in his Old Testament ethics, ethical issues are at every point related to God, to his character, his will, his actions, and his purpose. Old Testament ethics is grounded ultimately in the person of Yahweh, God of Israel, who is also revealed as God of all creation and humanity. Reflecting his quintessential character of justice, righteousness, truth, and compassion, Yahweh's moral demands and ethical expectations are not only upon Israel, but are also upon his people of all ages. Within a theological covenantal framework as prioritized by Dr. Wright, Old Testament ethics is principally theocentric, which renders it canonical and comprehensive, thereby saving it from being disunited, as is sometimes the case in critical scholarship. The third and last challenge I would like to highlight today is, echoing with the lecture title written for us, how we should apply Old Testament ethics in our age and how far we can make it relevant for the contemporary world. In fact, a dynamic concerning the applicability of Old Testament ethics has long been noted. As Earl Davies succinctly points out, on the one hand, many of the laws and customs of the Bible no longer seem relevant to contemporary communities of faith. On the other hand, many problems which do arise in the complex technological world which we inhabit are such that the Bible offers no exact guidance or direction by which they can be resolved. Thus, the dilemma of re relevancy is two-edged. For those who start with the historical ethics of the Old Testament would inevitably be confronted with the historical cultural gap between antiquity and our modern world. While the challenge for the historical approach is evident, any attempt that begins with modern ethical issues is no easy way either. In fact, a plurality of ethics in the contemporary society, for example, bioethics, medical ethics, political ethics, social ethics, economic ethics, legal ethics, family ethics, and so on, as to the complexity of modern ethics, and hence the difficulties in applying biblical ethics in our age. Notwithstanding the real and practical challenges, we should not be deterred from seeking to relate the Old Testament ethics to our contemporary life. If we, as a community of faith, are to believe what Dr. Wright envisions, Israel is God's paradigm, of what a nation ought ideally to be, and was therefore chosen to disclose God's wider purposes to the rest of humanity. We are indeed sharing the same mission with Israel in propagating the ethical way of life God demands of the whole humanity, his very people on earth. The relevance of, of, of Old Testament ethics, therefore, finds its anchor in the conviction that it is paradigmatic for all people across times and contexts. With this belief held, the aforementioned dilemmas might not necessarily dispirit us. Rather, they come to remind us to be in a spirit of humility as we seek to relate biblical ethical insights in our world. Perhaps the theme of this lecture series, written for us, means to speak to a humble heart and open ears as we are eager to live up the scripture. Lastly, I invite all of you to join me in thanking Dr. Wright for his most insightful and highly stimulating lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. Thank you.